Welcome, everyone. I'm Jim Goldgeier, Robert Bosch Senior Visiting Fellow at the Brookings Institution and a Senior Advisor to the Bridging of the Gap Initiative, which is housed at American University. Today's event is a collaboration between the Brookings Bosch Transatlantic Initiative, which aims to expand transatlantic networks and cooperation to address global challenges, and the Bridging the Gap New Voices in National Security Initiative, which seeks to expand the national security debate with research from emerging scholars, particularly those from outside Washington, DC. I'm delighted that one of Bridging the Gap's New Voices scholars, Dr. Sarah Björg Muller, is, is on the experts panel that will follow our keynote conversation. We're grateful to the Robert Bosch Foundation and the Raymond Frankel Foundation for their generous support of our important initiatives. We're privileged at Brookings to receive funding from a diverse group of foundations, individuals, NGOs, corporations, governments, and others who share our commitment to independent research that leads to innovative ideas for addressing global challenges. And we're grateful for their respect for the value we place on our independence. Today's event reflects only the views of the speakers themselves. I'm joined for the first part of this webinar by Congressman Andy Kim, who represents the third congressional district of New Jersey, and who serves on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, the House Armed Services Committee, and the House Committee on Small Business. Prior to serving in the House, Congressman Kim worked as a career public servant under both Democrats and Republicans, serving at USAID, the Pentagon, the State Department, the White House National Security Council, and in Afghanistan as an advisor to Generals Petraeus and Allen. And at a time when there's been increased violence against Asian and Asi Asians and Asian Americans, including the horrific killings in Atlanta earlier this week, Congressman Kim has been an important voice in the US Congress. You can send us your questions for Congressman Kim via email to events at brookings.edu or on Twitter using the hashtag US Alliances. Congressman Kim, thank you so much for joining us. I know it's been a very difficult week for you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jim, for the kind introduction. Thank you for raising the the tragedy in Atlanta. It's been a really tough uh, last two days uh, for for me and my family, as well as the Asian American community all over the country. And we're trying to find our best way to mourn. Uh, appreciate President Biden's uh, visit down there today, and and hopefully those are the engagements and the steps uh, to be able to heal. Well, thank you for all that you are that you are doing. So I want to start by noting that that after the end of the Cold War, uh, expertise in foreign policy uh, in Congress, oversight of the executive branch on foreign policy by the Congress, uh, declined uh, uh, dramatically in the subsequent decades. In 2018, you and a number of other national security professionals were elected to the House and have now been reelected. How do you and your colleagues see the challenges of building back a stronger congressional role in foreign policy and national security? Well, first of all, it's a real honor to be able to serve alongside um, you know, some of the members that, that you're referencing and just the incredible expertise that they bring to the table. Uh, and also uh, it's, it's really great because we've become such close friends too. Um, and we've had these experiences. I've gone on CODELs to Afghanistan with Jason Crow, Abigail Spanberger, and others. And you know, we're really talking to each other with a lot of uh, openness and, and honesty about some of the things that we want to see done. We don't always see eye to eye, and we have some disagreements. Uh, but it's it's a really good uh, amount of energy. So that that's one aspect of it. It's just the energy that we're bringing to the table. Um, and also, the, uh, I'd say the other major factor here is, is our experience. Um, being able to draw on that experience, um, being able to help shape the thinking of some of our colleagues or shape the, the direction in which we're trying to go. Um, I think that that's been one of the most uh, interesting components of it. Uh, and in terms of the kind of impact we're trying to make, um, you know, you and I kind of talked about this just a little bit ago. Um, I think each of us is, is, is we're still kind of settling in and understanding uh, where we can make the most impact and, and what kind of voice we want to have and what kind of issues we want to focus in on. Uh, for instance, for me, I, you know, I served on the Armed Services Committee uh, last term. Now I serve on both Armed Services and Foreign Affairs Committees. And that was a very intentional decision because I, I really felt like in my first two years, uh, some of these issues that we face right now, like the, what happens next on Afghanistan, or uh, you know, what do we do vis-a-vis uh, -vis China? 
uh, over the coming years and decades. Uh, I didn't feel like I could get quite at those questions in the way that I wanted to just on the Armed Services Committee. And I'm trying to bring about sort of an ability to have a more comprehensive 360 view on the work uh, that I want to see done. And you know, how do we look at this, not just in a siloed way. And I know we experienced that, that kind of issue on the executive branch side of just you know, sometimes being kind of siloed into our department's views or our bureau's views, uh, whether regionally or, or functionally. Uh, and, and we struggle from some of those same challenges on the Hill. And you know, trying to figure out how we can structure over that is something that I'm very engaged in. And I think a lot of us uh, with that experience are trying to figure out those same questions. Great, thank you. And, and so our theme for this morning's session is revitalizing US alliances. Um, we know that our allies wanna believe the United States is committed to its alliances, but uh, they're a little wary regarding uh, future US reliability. What role do you think the Congress can play in the effort to reassure other countries that the president who gets elected in 2024 or 2028 or, or whatever down the road, uh, who might take a different view than the, the current president on alliances, can't easily threaten our alliances unilaterally? And, and to be more specific, what, what role is there that Congress can play in providing reassurance that the United States won't simply leave an alliance or reduce its effectiveness just because we might have a, a, a president down the road who thinks alliances aren't advantageous for the United States. So how I kind of boil down this, this issue, it goes down to just this fundamental question, which is uh, what is the value of the American handshake right now? You know, what does that actually mean to other people? Not just in terms of what does it mean to us? So much of how we often talk about allies and partners we're thinking about in terms of how does it benefit us? What is it that we're trying to get out of this? How can we use this and maximize this for our global advantage? And that's an important aspect of it. But uh, what I've been spending a lot of time on over the last couple of months is really trying to understand from the perspective of some of our counterparts around the world, what does the American handshake mean to them right now? And what are they trying to get out of our relationship and our strategic partnerships that are out there? And I think that that's something that we very often overlook, especially when it comes to, for instance, our efforts right now to think about uh, a coalition or allies and partners vis-a-vis -vis our relationship to China. I think you know it's very important that we have a better understanding of what some of our, our allies and partners or potential partners are actually looking for uh, out of uh, working with us. And as I talk to them, um, and, and this is one aspect of where you know, Congress can play a role is, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of direct uh, discussions from legislature to legislature and been trying to build up those relationships in a lateral way. And I think, you know, that is something that Congress is very well placed to do. Um, and it, it helps complement and helps build upon executive branch uh, interactions. And I think just think the more densely we are able to have these connections, the stronger the partnerships are. Because in the same way that, that Congress plays a role in determining uh, our allies and our treaties and our, our obligations and our responsibilities, and we have that type of voice, the same thing is happening in other countries as they are thinking about whether or not we are the right partner for them, if well, how to be able to partner with us. So our ability in Congress to really inform uh, and connect with and build relations with, uh, with legislature voices and in parliaments and legislatures around the world, that is important. Helps build a 360 and three-dimensional view of what it is we're trying to do uh, in the US. But when we when we look at that, that there is that question there of American commitment and follow-through. And uh, honestly, uh, what I've seen and what I've heard is people are still waiting and seeing. Um, I, I think that there are a lot of leaders around the world that just that they don't know uh, if they can really understand and, and predict what's going to happen with the pendulum swing of American politics. And that's why it gets back to this issue so much as well about, about how so much of foreign policy starts here at home. Um, and that the, the better that we can try to, to manage the situation here, the, the stronger we can get through this pandemic, the stronger we can help our recovery, that really does have enormous impact in terms of the capabilities that we will have 
internationally. So I, I've really, as you know, someone who's been in foreign policy my whole career previous to my time in Congress, I, I've really have seen in my own eyes sort of this erasure of the firewall between foreign policy and domestic policy. And I really do think we need to be thinking better and stronger about how it is we can leverage uh, and, and draw upon our domestic gains for foreign policy benefits. And I think that's one of the most important things that can help our efforts with our allies is just showing stability, you know, showing that steady hand at the wheel. Uh, that is really the, the number one issue that I keep hearing from, uh, from, from partners around the world uh, in terms of their questions of, of whether or not uh, we are the kind of partner they want to, to connect with. Well, it's interesting because, you know, presidents typically jealously guard their prerogatives. We've seen President Biden and Secretary of State Blinken indicate they recognize Congress needs to play a stronger role in foreign policy. They've made statements. Uh, of course, you know, President Biden had a long career in the United States Senate. Uh, he actually wrote a, a Georgetown, a co-authored a law journal, a Georgetown Law Journal article back in 1988 uh, writing against the sort of monarchist view of the U.S. president when it comes to use of force and argued for joint decision making and a more affirmative congressional role. And he's now called for a revision of the authorization to use military force that's been on the books for two decades and, and needs revision. And there's been talk of revision. What do you think that the support that's been given so far by the president and secretary of state for a stronger congressional role will mean for relations between the White House and Congress? Well, I'm, I'm encouraged by it so far, and uh, I, you know, I, I was able to see Secretary Blinken before he went off on um, his latest trip to Asia, and we talked about this a, a bit. I, I think there is, is room for us to, to take some first initiatives here, like the repealing or reforming of the AUMFs. I think that's one of the, the first things that will kind of test uh, this, uh, this thinking. I think that you know many of us felt um, that, that, that this is a place where we can try to work together and think through what do our armed services need uh, and, and armed forces need in terms of understanding their authorizations and, and how wide should it be. There's still some significant um, uh, discrepancies here in terms of it in Congress. Uh, we're trying to work our way through that, but I, I think that's a positive development. And I think it's an important development because uh, you know, I think there was a lot, there was some initial tension when it came to the Syria strikes um, and, and sort of about congressional notification and other aspects like that. And I think that's sort of an element that we need to work on. But, but here, Jim, let me kind of lay out how I look at this uh, in terms of ways in which we can frame how this kind of cooperation, where this cooperation will work. I often kind of see the work that Congress can do when it comes to foreign policy in, in three major categories. One is structural, one is systemic and strategic, and one is, uh, is immediate. So with the structural, there's a, a, an element where we can connect with each other and work together through the National Defense Authorization Acts, a potential you know, kind of resurgence of an authorization type of effort on the State Department and foreign affairs type area. Um, and other efforts that we can do that talk about just the, the actual structural components of, of State Department and the, the Pentagon and our defense budget and other efforts like that. That is a, an element of it. You see that with the discussions about diversity within our, our foreign, uh, you know, our, our diplomatic corps and, and other aspects of our civil service as well. Um, you know, those are some elements that are uh, that we'll be seeing more engagement on. And I think that that's a very natural place for engagement. There is, I'll, I'll switch to the immediate uh, bucket, um, which is what you see a lot of right now in terms of the discussions about what happens next with, uh, with Afghanistan and, and what happened with this, the serious strikes and was that uh, the right thing to do? Uh, we see that right now leading up to what happens next on Iran. And then there's that, that middle bucket, which is what I, I kind of call strategic, um, which I think about sort of as a more longer term vision of just where, what do we want our relationship with the China be? What do we have a vision of for a positive vision for the Middle East? Those are three different, fundamentally different ways in which Congress can operate. 
And I think too much of what I've seen actually falls into that category of the immediate. Uh, I think too often, I think Congress really is, is putting too much of their emphasis uh, just on the news of the day and the headlines of today. And I don't think that's actually where Congress can have the biggest impact when it comes to the Biden administration and trying to reassert its uh, authorizations. If you look at the Constitution, a lot of what is laid out for in Article One is actually in that strategic box. Uh, but the challenge is, is that our politics have gotten so nearsighted. You know, we are often operating just one day at a time, one tweet at a time, and uh, our ability to think through what does it mean to to be able to, to shape the strategic nature of our foreign policy uh, really has dwindled on, on the Hill. And, and a number of us are, are trying to see if we can bring that back, but uh, especially when it comes to, for instance, investments in artificial intelligence and ne next generation technologies, future-proofing our military, or steps about uh, you know, energy of the future and how do we keep the United States to be the, the innovator and the, uh, the, the global leader in the energy of the future. Those are strategic efforts that require, you know, five years, 10 years down the road type of thinking. Uh, and I really do hope that Congress is able to engage in that. That will be part of the AUMF discussion, that will be part of these other efforts, but making sure we don't just look at them in terms of what's happening right now, but trying to think forward about uh, how we can shape it. And I think that is hopefully where we can have the best impact. I think that that would be something that the Biden administration would be uh, uh, open to engaging in as well. Um, and um, you know, so we'll kind of see from there how we pull that together. Well, let's bring your constituents into the picture here. Um, very curious to know what kind of foreign policy issues are, are on their mind. What do they raise with you uh, when you're speaking back in the district, what foreign policy issues do you raise with them? Um, how important is it to your constituents that you're now on both the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the House Armed Services Committee? This is uh, this is something that I think about a, a lot. Um, you know, there's always this kind of this kind of uh, saying. Uh, I feel like, especially in the Beltway, where where um, you know, elections are not won or lost on foreign policy and that, you know, for the most part, the American people, unless we're at war, aren't really thinking about it. And I, I challenge that assumption, I do. A couple of things really stood out, stood out to me. As I mentioned, I, you know, I traveled to Afghanistan uh, late 2019 before, before the pandemic set in. And when I came back from Afghanistan, I wasn't allowed to the public notify that I was in Afghanistan until I touched back down in CONUS. And I remember when I, uh, as soon as I did, I, I sent out a notice to my constituents and saying that in five days from now, we're going to do an in-person town hall on Afghanistan, uh, brief out what I saw and talk about next steps. We had nearly 400 people show up in about five days, with only five days notice. And I was really blown away by their engagement, their questions. Uh, now, granted, yeah, I do uh, represent a district with a joint military base, uh, McGuire, Dix, Lakehurst, Fort Dix, for, for many who 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 passed through. Um, but that being said, a lot of the people that showed up were not affiliated with the base, uh, were not service members or veterans or, or, or otherwise uh, public servants in, in any ways. There was a real hunger to know what's going on. And... I see that with a lot of the other work that I do. I find that oftentimes my constituents are sometimes uh, unsure how to ask the first question or, or unsure how to kind of get into the topics. But once we start on it, there are a lot of opinions, a lot of thoughts on this. And it kind of reminded me of something, an experience I had when I worked at the White House before. Uh, I was at the NSC when uh, we started the counter ISIS war in 2014. And when I look back on that, one of the things I, I wish we had done was more direct engagement with the American people, explaining the mission, explaining why we were doing this, explaining our strategy, because I did feel, feel like we lost control of that narrative for a while. Um, I think Congress is well placed to do that. Uh, I certainly would like the executive branch to do more engagements on foreign policy with our communities as well. But I really do think that we owe it to the American people to do more, not just like press briefings at, at, at the White House or the State Department, but actually going out to the communities, 
actually trying to, to talk and learn how to talk human about these issues. Uh, the more I try to do that, the more I find that there is an incredible appetite in my district to have a voice on Afghanistan, to have a voice on, on what happens next, uh, and have a voice on what's going to happen after this pandemic. Uh, I think a lot of people recognize that this is a paradigm shift moment. A lot of people feel like this is one of those moments like 9-11 like or the fall of the Berlin Wall. And they're very concerned about what happens next, they, but they don't, you know, they don't really know what the, what's going to come next and what this new global order is going to look like. They have a ton of questions about what should we be doing with China and how do we engage uh, with China. And the less we talk directly to them, the more that some of these more toxic threads that hit at some of the xenophobia that we're worried about when it comes to how we talk about China and other elements, the more that that fills that space. You know, that, 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 that kind of thinking can, can take root. And that would be incredibly damaging, not just to the Asian American community here in the United States, but in terms of giving us operating space and decision space when it comes to uh, to our engagements with China. So, you know, those are some of the angles I think about a lot when it comes to what Congress can do, but also about how the American people are, are, are feeling about this situation right now. There is, I, I represent a district that Trump won twice. I'm one of only seven Democrats left in the country that represents a, a district that, that Trump won. Uh, so I engage on a daily basis with a lot of people that still think he won the election, still think that, um, you know, that his approaches of America first uh, are the right approaches. Um, we cannot just ignore that. Uh, we, we cannot just push that aside and think that uh, kind of a, a, a Biden foreign policy and an effort of professionalism on that effort is going to be able to erase that. Um, and if we don't uh, tackle it for, uh, head on, uh, I, I think it could be extremely disruptive in the years to come. Well, your, your remarks lead right into a question that we got actually from one of our uh, audience members, Professor Joyce Barr from Virginia Tech, uh, who asked, given the recent past, will America be more of a partner than a leader in the future? Sort of gets the question about what, what does American leadership look like going forward? And how much does it mean being a partner with others as opposed to just telling everyone else what to do, which is the way we approached it in the 1990s? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a really important question. And I think, you know, I, I see that most pronounced um, and, and you see that in some of the engagements that happen uh, with Secretary Blinken and, and others and Secretary Austin out in, in Asia, for instance, when they visited uh, South Korea and Japan um, with uh, General Austin, I think down in India now. Um, this, this idea, I, I do feel like the, the word partner is, is coming up a lot more. This, this idea that we recognize that, um, that, that there needs to be that, that respect shown. And I think this is kind of, Jim, this kind of gets back to, I think, one of your first questions, which is just like, are our allies and partners receptive to us now? And I, I do think that the use of the word partner and the framing of it in that way is meant to show that respect that a lot of these institutions and a lot of these partners feel like they did not get over the last four years. When you see um, our former president and what he said about the NATO alliance or how he treated uh, the UN or the Paris Climate Agreement and other aspects of that, it, it was not actually just the policies that were damaging, it was this issue about respect. And are we respecting international institutions? Are we respecting our global coalitions and our partnerships? I know South Korea felt enormously, enormously disrespected in terms of how some of the, the, the uh, military spending uh, uh, partnership discussions were going with the Trump administration over uh, how much share should, should each be uh, be going at this about. Um, so, you know, those are, those are some of the, the major things that we need to be addressing. That doesn't mean that we're not a leader. That doesn't mean that there are places for us to, to really press on the gas, but it requires us to have a, a real strategic vision of what we're trying to get towards. So as I said, like, I, I really think we should be 
we should be a leader and pressing as hard as we can when it comes to next generation, next generation technologies, investments in AI and, and other aspects of this, um, you know, hypersonic technology and directed energy, things like that, that I think are going to reshape not only the warfighter, but uh, so much of how our global order is structured. Also about energy and our ability to, to be that kind of leader. I think that those are places where we should uh, really show our strength, uh, put our resources behind it. And I do think that that's a place where we can really pave the way. Um, but it, it'll be sort of a, a, a sort of a balance there that we'll need to feel defined. Um, I want to come back to the constituent issue uh, because scholars have tried to understand the link between trust in government and the ability of government to carry out its policies. And curious how much trust in government comes up in your conversations with your constituents. Um, you know, how important do you see trust from the American people in enabling the US government to pursue its objectives overseas? Well, it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's enormously important. And I, I certainly see this as, um, as one of the biggest challenges we have. I'll be very honest, um, people in my district are, are very uh, uh, wary of what's happening in government. Um, from all, and I, that's all across the political spectrum. That's why I've been uh, so uh, vocal and forceful in terms of some of the reforms that we're trying to do uh, with HR1 and, and campaign finance and gerrymandering and things like that. You know, I think there's this very pervasive sense that that our democracy and our system of governance is broken. Uh, I think that there is this, there's, there's, there's that element of it where there's definitely a lot of, 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 of sort of a lack of, of trust there. And that, that makes things come through this lens of, of, of deep skepticism constantly um, from a lot of people that I talk to that, that they are always everything that the government does. They they try to figure out you know where's the where's the, where's the the truth in here? What's the the underside here that that's uh, going to screw me over, or screw my family over, and that kind of approach. I hear that a lot. And the other aspect of this that I think is problematic is um, our democracy has become so uh, obsessed with elections and campaigning as sort of a synonym to democracy. I mean, it's certainly no doubt a huge part of our democracy, but uh, having worked in a number of other countries on democracy issues, I find that you know the United States remains the single most election obsessed nation in the world. And as a result, uh, I think a lot of American people think of, when they think of democracy, they think of elections and th they don't think as much about governance. And I think, you know, look, I have to say the same for, for, uh, for some of us on Capitol Hill as well, um, that, that we, we, we need to put more emphasis on the governance side of what we do and, and not just frame our democracy as an election, because that inherently makes our democracy founded on partisanship and on competition and inherently one that I think accentuates the hyperpartisanship that we're experiencing right now. So I really do think that there's such an importance, not just to reform the structure of democracy, but to really try to revitalize and redefine how we talk about it and where we place our emphasis. And if we live in a, in a society of just a nonstop campaign mode, which is essentially where we are right now, then we will bring about all of the, the downsides of living in that kind of experience. And I think that that's what exhausts the American people. That's what gives them so much feeling that it is just never going to end and always going to be in this partisanship framework. And they just tune out. A lot of them just tune out because they just don't want to participate in that. They know they're sick and tired of it. Well, we have about 30 seconds left. And I just wanted to give you an opportunity to close by saying something, if you want, with respect to something the Biden administration has made a centerpiece of its foreign policy, which is this notion of a foreign policy for the middle class. I mean, what, is that, what does that mean to you? In just a, 30 seconds or less, what does that mean to you? Well, look, it's about speaking human, about what we're trying to do, about anchoring uh, this question of, are the things that the government is working on focus on trying to improve the lives of the American people. That's really it. Whether it's domestic policy or foreign policy, are your lives, the lives of you and your family, improving because of these actions? 
And it's on us to think about how to shape foreign policy to answer that fundamental question of why it is we're doing it and why it's gonna improve people's lives. Well, Congressman Kim, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We're really grateful that you were able to take the time. And again, you know, we're grateful for all you're doing uh, for the country in general, and uh, particularly in this period of, of tremendous insecurity and fear among um, the Asian American community. I know it's been a difficult time and, and thank you for everything you're doing. Our hearts, our hearts go out to all of the members of, uh, of our Asian American community here. Thanks, that means a lot, Jim, thank you. I now turn the event over to my Brookings colleague, Dr. Tanvi Madan, who will introduce and moderate our panel. Dr. Madan is a senior fellow and director of the India Project at Brookings. Her book, Fateful Triangle, How China Shaped US-India Relations During the Cold War was published last year. And she is a close observer of the Quad and other interest-based coalitions that are currently forming. Tanvi, over to you. Uh, thank you, Jim, and good morning to all of you. Um, we, often, we often joke in Washington um, that every week is infrastructure week here, um, but it struck me that the last month or so has been Allies and Partners Month. Um, we've seen uh, the quadrilateral or quad summit a week ago with President Biden hosting the leaders of Australia, Japan, and India. Uh, we've seen Secretary of State Blinken and Secretary of Defense Austin visit Japan and South Korea in back-to-back -back visits for two plus two meetings uh, and bilaterals as well. Uh, we've seen National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan um, speak with a number of his European uh, counterparts, including uh, from uh, Britain, Germany, and France, as well as the NATO Secretary General, uh, not to mention Secretary Blinken, and this is all happening ahead of Secretary Blinken, and National Security Advisor Sullivan's meeting with their Chinese counterparts uh, that is still ongoing. Uh, and to add to that, we have uh, Secretary Austin having just spoken a few hours ago to his Australian counterpart, Marie Spain. Uh, and as we speak, a uh, meeting with Prime Minister Modi in India where he will spend uh, the weekend. Um, so we've seen a lot of activity. Uh, Jim, Agnieszka Block and I didn't plan it this way, but there could not have been a better week uh, to discuss revitalizing alliances because of everything uh, that's going on. And I'm thrilled to be joined by a stellar panel uh, to discuss that with. Uh, Victor Cha, who is uh, Senior Vice President and Career Chair at the uh, uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies, as well as Vice Dean for Faculty and Graduate Affairs uh, and uh, a Professor of Government at Georgetown University, uh, Zach Cooper, uh, uh, in the days that we would, uh, we were actually in our offices, our neighbor uh, at the American Enterprise Institute, a research fellow there, and co-director of the Alliance for Securing Democracy. Uh, Alexandra de hoop a uh, director of research of transatlantic security and director of the Paris office of the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Uh, and Sarah Obiag Muller, who is an assistant professor uh, at the School of Diplomacy and International Re Relations at Seton Hall uh, University. Uh, before I turn to the panel, for those of you who have questions, uh, please continue to submit them through emailing us at events at brookings.edu uh, or on Twitter uh, with the hashtag US Alliances. Um, so one of the things we've seen um, over the last kind of few uh, weeks and the last couple of months indeed, is uh, two things from the Biden administration's foreign policy approach. Uh, one has been this talk uh, that particularly Jake Sullivan has talked about is approaching the world from a position of strength, which has involved both kind of domestic recovery and reinvention uh, and revitalizing alliances and partners. Uh, Victor, the other element we've seen is the Biden administration signaling uh, that the Indo-Pacific or Asia, if you prefer, will be a priority. Um, and shoring up alliances and partnerships there. And we've seen that in, these, in this range of engagements. What is your assessment of the Biden administration's approach uh, to allies in the region? How are countries um, in the region viewing the administration and its approach thus far? Thanks, Tanvi. Um, it's a, uh, and first, thank you for inviting me to be part of this very, um, this terrific panel and with um, such great colleagues. I really appreciate the opportunity um, so, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, it, they're off to a great start. I, you know, don't know another way to put it. Um, you know, they, uh, the President Biden signaled this during the campaign and his po foreign policy advisors 
you know, in their, in their various articles um, have signaled that this would be the idea. I think for many of the allies and partners around the world, this is a welcome relief. Uh, I don't, I feel like they probably did not recognize the United States over the past four years. They didn't understand the language that the United States was using with regard to its alliances and, uh, and the devaluing of alliance partnerships around the world. Um, uh, there's a lot of continuity, at least with regard to Asia, uh, in terms of both the personnel and the strategy. Um, if, uh, if it was the pivot to Asia or the rebalance under the Obama administration, this is sort of phase two of that. Um, <clears throat> uh, but there's a lot of, there was some lost ground that had to be recovered, you know, undeniably after the last four years. And, um, you know, it, and, and the way we've seen this emerge, I, I've referred to it as a great one-two punch. The way we've seen this emerge, as you said, Tanvi, is, um, you know, the two plus two, the quad, then the two plus two, and then you go to Anchorage and talk to the, talk to the Chinese. Um, as many people on this call, as many viewers know, um, um, the um, short of a summit, you know, the, the highest level that you could use to sort of signal commitments to allies is a two plus two. Uh, which are notoriously difficult, I would argue as a former NSC staffer, even harder to, to arrange than a presidential summit because you're trying to coordinate four principal schedules. It's virtually, I, it, I think it took us over two years to arrange a two plus two with Australia. Right? I mean, that's how it was just, it's just really difficult. So it's a very important signal. There's substance there too. Um, uh, the quad, I mean, we can talk about the quad. I thought it was a fantastic idea the way they carried it out. And then the op-ed, of course, uh, really just a fantastic idea. So I think they're off to a great start. Um, Alexander, I wanna turn to you where there's been kind of less continuity perhaps on the European side, but I wanna ask you a similar question about Europe. There've been, as I said, a number of calls exchanged bilaterally, but also with uh, the E3, um, Britain, France, and Germany, uh, which uh, I believe, uh, or as Johnson tried to label the transatlantic quad, let's see if that catches. Um, but also a visit by climate, uh, climate envoy John Kerry as well. Um, we could had Congressman Kim uh, just earlier talk about um, what does the American handshake mean to allies and partners uh, these days? And so I wanna ask you that about European allies and partners, how is the Biden administration's foreign policy an approach towards Europe being seen in the region, and to, to you know, what does that? What is the value of that American handshake for Europeans today? Well, thank you, Tanvi, and it's really nice to be with you today. Um, I'm sitting in um, in Paris, so um, I will bring a, a European perspective to the to the discussion. I think that you know, when uh, President Biden says uh, America is back, um, I think here in Europe we understand it as American consultation with allies uh, is back. Um, and you've mentioned the E3, these different informal formats uh, of cooperation and dialogue between the United States and France, Germany, and uh, the, the UK. I mean, that was a very clear signal sent to uh, Europe immediately after Biden's inauguration. Uh, there's been almost a weekly E3 plus United States meeting on many strategic issues uh, where we obviously share uh, common interests and common concerns. Uh, number Number one being Iran, but also climate, but also Burma. Uh, so this has been, I must say, an immediate and healthy uh, process. And in terms of how it has been perceived and received here, it has been received extremely positively. And I'll take one concrete example that took place this week, uh, which is uh, Jake Sullivan uh, calling uh, the, his German, French, British counterparts, but also having a conversation with the NATO Secretary General to give a preview of the meetings uh, that were going to take place between Antony Blinken, himself, Jake Sullivan, but also Austin uh, and others with Asian partners and more precisely with Chinese officials. And what was interesting is that he made these conversations 
public in terms of showing how these consultations before an important US-Chinese meeting was extremely important. So that to me has been a real change. Then I would say the test uh, for transatlantic cooperation is how do you translate uh, this revitalized consultations into um, a more, a more co-leadership, more co-decision-making uh, processes, especially in the decisive final phases of a negotiation. And I'm specifically talking about, you know, Afghanistan, which is also a transatlantic issue, but much more broadly an international issue that we are dealing with uh, as we are heading towards the May 1st uh, deadline. Uh, but there, there is again, an example of the EU Brussels uh, not being invited and being sidelined um, in terms of organizing, you know, this April interministerial meeting uh, under the aegis of the United Nations, despite uh, the important role that the EU plays, especially in terms of civilian aid to Afghanistan. So that would be, I would say, one of my recommend initial recommendations. Uh, thanks, Alexandra. Um, you know, and and you mentioned kind of NATO, and I want to, Sarah, turn to you on that. I actually want to talk about the alliance in Europe, uh, NATO, and then I'm going to turn to Zach to, to ask about um, the non-alliance in, in Asia, or the Indo-Pacific, the Quad. But Sarah, first to you, um, you've actually called for uh, a, a discontinuity, at least in some ways, in Europe. There's obviously been, with NATO, a strange period during the Trump administration, um, though, though um, Secretary General uh, Stoltenberg did navigate that quite delicately and carefully, uh, the Biden administration, as we mentioned, has kind of quickly reached out um, to the, the, the NATO Secretary General. We also saw Secretary Austin's particip participation in the Defense Ministerial. Um, but as I said, you, you mentioned that NATO cannot go back to business as usual. So it's not that you can hit rewind. Um, why do you say that? And if you want to kind of address the point about Afghanistan as well, because of course NATO has had, uh, has had a role there, um, any thoughts you might have on, on how uh, the countries should proceed? Thank you, Tanvi. And my thanks to the Brookings Institution, the Robert Bosch Foundation, the Bridging the Gap Initiative for inviting me today to this distinguished panel. Uh, first, I wanna echo some of the points that Alexandra just made. Uh, I'm a college professor, so uh, I would probably give the Biden administration an incomplete on trans Atlantic relations so far. It's still early days, of course. We're gonna reach the 60 day milestone or marker this weekend. So far, they've been striking all the right tones, the phone calls, reiterating America's commitment to Article 5, uh, along with what Alexandra just mentioned. I thought it was a very good sign, especially in light of the fracas in Alaska yesterday that Jake Sullivan briefed Stoltenberg, the Secretary General of NATO and the E3 in advance of the US-China in a summit. Um, but I think uh, the big developments on NATO will come at the first summit, the leader summit later this year. And we have to wait and see. Um, it's widely rumored and expected uh, following on the work of the NATO 23 initiative that Secretary uh, Stoltenberg convened last year that NATO will call for a new strategic concept. Uh, it's first since 2010. I think this is very good. Uh, the previous strategic concept did not include the words China or the Arctic. Um, obviously, the strategic environment has progressed, moved since then. Um, but in many respects, coming to the recognition that it's time for a new strategic concept is the easy part. For years, NATO members recognized there was a need for a strategic concept update, but avoided doing so because they were afraid of opening the can of worms. And so the hard work will begin once we start this strategic concept review. And it's expected that it will conclude prior to Secretary General's departure from his position uh, in September of 2022. And I'm sure we will have a Brookings event, uh, our CUSC, uh, Center for US and Europe, will host something then about that. Zach, I want to turn to you and um, the Indo-Pacific, um, particularly um, the Quad, an interest-based, like-minded coalition of allies and partners of the kind you've written about. Um, we saw this kind of historic leader summit on Friday. Uh, it was the first time a leader summit was held. And 
Well, there were complaints earlier that they, the Quad never had joint statements. Not only did we get a joint statement, we got a fact sheet, we got briefings, and we got an op-ed. Um, what was your assessment of that leaders' summit? Um, and, you know, you've, you've written about these coalitions, and, you know, what, in your mind, are kind of the advantages and disadvantages that you see of these kinds of uh, coalitions, um, especially compared to alliances? Well, thanks, Tanvi. It's, I think, just fantastic that you're hosting this discussion and you are the queen of the quad. Uh, so I will I will wade in here, but I look forward to your views on this as well. Um, I thought the quad meeting was really successful. Um, there are a couple of attacks that people have made on the quad over the years, right? One is that it's just an anti-China coalition. Well, actually, if you look at the quad statement, it doesn't mention China once, right? Um, another is that the quad can't deliver. It, it's just a talk shop and it doesn't do anything. Well, it did, right? They've come up with a, a plan for roughly a billion doses of vaccine. And then the third attack, and, and I think this is the, the toughest one perhaps, um, is that if you invest more in the quad, it's going to distract from the other institutions in Asia, in particular from ASEAN. And I think it was particularly smart that the vaccine initiative is focused on Southeast Asia and delivering positive value to Southeast Asia, right? So what they did last Friday was push back against each of these areas of attack on the quad. And oh, by the way, do it in the first leaders meeting. Um, so, you know, many of us in think tanks, we, we stay busy by critiquing administrations, but on this one, I think they got it right. Um, and I think it's important that they did it before going uh, to Anchorage and having what seemed to be a pretty tense series of discussions to send the message that the U.S. is focused on getting the region right and the China relationship is going to have to fit in to the rest of the region. Um, I think the, the one tricky thing for the Biden team now is, you know, Secretary Austin, I think, just landed in India. So obviously he's, he's going to do his discussions there. We've had the two plus twos with Japan and Korea. Uh, we're in the middle of the Anchorage meeting. The one place where we haven't had deep engagement yet is in Southeast Asia. And yes, there have been phone calls between various American leaders and their counterparts, um, but I think that Southeast Asia piece is missing a little bit. And look, this is hard, right? I mean, the idea that anyone was going to try and hold a quad meeting in the first two months of the new administration and hold it at the leader level with a major deliverable, I don't think most of us would have thought it would be possible. And to do that the same week that you're doing two, two plus twos, the first major bilat with the Chinese and a trip to India, uh, you know, this is tough stuff. But they're still going to have to show Southeast Asia that the U.S. is really engaged and that the Quad isn't supplanting ASEAN centrality. I, I think that increasingly is going to be a debate in, in, in Asia, which is gonna be a pretty tricky issue to try and manage. Uh, before I turn uh, to Alexandra and Sarah on this, I wanna bring Victor in, because Victor, you've written um, entire books about you know, the hub and spoke model in, in Asia and why that developed. Uh, and we've seen, including just today, a, a, a de Defense Department official talk about in the Indo-Pacific kind of uh, moving to a kind of a more networked or web of alliances and partnerships and coalitions model. Um, what do you think of this kind of shift? Um, and particularly, I'd like your thoughts on a country like uh, the Republic of Korea. South Korea said, we've heard some, we had some journalists asked at the State Department briefing, why isn't um, South Korea a member of the Quad? Would it want to be? Uh, there doesn't seem to be an expansion plan, but what is the way to bring South Korea into these conversations and other countries like South Korea who are not part of the Quad? Right, thanks. Um, so the, the, first thing, uh, the first thing is that, um, so I, I was actually involved in the original Quad <laughs> in, in um, 2004, 2005, when the Indian Ocean tsunami hit. It was actually my first week at the NSC. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. Um, but, um, you know, at that time, uh, we, the, the, the so-called quad was pulled together. And, and I think I agree with everything that Zach said, possibly with the exception of the second citation of the criticism of the quad, because um, that certainly is a criticism levied against uh, some of the Southeast Asian, uh, Asia-based uh, regionalism. But, you know, the quad from its inception, at least with the Indian Ocean tsunami, did deliver, right? It delivered right away. It largely de delivered because the UN was not in a position to deliver. 
Nobody else was in a position to deliver at that particular time. Um, and it, it continued in some format later on, also informal. Um, but as Zach said, the press uh, always talked about it as some sort of anti-China conspiracy, but the Quad substantively was never, it, it was never about China. I was in all the conversations with the Quad from 2004 to 2007, and we never talked about China. I mean, we talked about many other things, um, our early warning tsunami systems, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan at the time, counterterrorism, um, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't about China. And the, the theory though was that the dialogue, the habits of cooperation that were created through all of these other um, areas of cooperation would serve the United States and its partners in Asia well in the, now or in the future vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis China. So, so uh, that's on the quad. On, on networks, um, yeah, I mean, I think we all know that one of the reasons that regionalism um, grew so slowly in Asia uh, was because of the very strong imprint of the U.S. hub and spokes alliance system. Every country in the region got what they needed from the United States, and, that, and the strength of that system actually decreased the incentives for countries to work across mm -hmm. and with each other. Um, um, and, but, but now, of course, it, it, there's much more networking taking place. Um, it's something encouraged by, by the United States, by the, by the hub. Um, and, and that's all a positive thing. Um, and when it comes to Korea, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm of the view that Korea should join the Quad. I don't think there's any question about it. Um, everything that the Quad talked about is Zach laid out are things that South Korea as, uh, one, as the fifth prominent democracy in Asia um, is, is uh, believes in. Um, and if their concern is a reaction from China, um, <clears throat> Uh, my own view is that China is much more likely to treat these countries with more caution and with greater respect if they're part of a group um, than if they are on their own, right? And, uh, and that's the case for Korea. That's the case for any, any one of these countries. If there's anything we learned from the past four years is that no country can deal with China on its own. Uh, and, and that's why this, this coalition of diplomacy the networking, the quad, the, the, this is really the right strategy going forward. Um, I'm, I'm actually gonna come back to the kind of fracas in uh, Anchorage um, a little bit, in a little bit, but I do wanna kind of bring in Alexandra and Sarah here. And we've got some questions on this as well. I mean, part of this network is not just been involved kind of the Indo-Pacific, but we've seen Asians and European countries either involving the US or just on their own. Um, you know, I, uh, to, to me, I, I think of something like an Australia, India, France trilateral, uh, potentially a you know, maritime uh, security cooperation, which they're emphasizing in a lot of work there, potentially even an exercise. Um, and so you are seeing kind of this network develop, but we've had a couple of questions on this question from um, Sabine Rassata, uh, a professor at Castle University who says, what, what do you think of, from a kind of European perspective of this kind of alliance of democracies that people have been talking about, a coalition, if you don't want to use the alliances, uh, to, and as it's framed to counter an authoritarian challenge, and you know, what format of cooperation would you both recommend? And then a related question is this prioritization of regions. Uh, Biresh Banerjee, senior editor and anchor at Deutsche Welle asks, um, you know, you've seen the Biden administration have a flurry of activity with Asia, uh, has it decided, or do you see it as deciding that the Indo-Pacific alliances are going to be more important than European ones, uh, particularly given the less than enthusiastic response from Europeans so far, particularly in the question of China? So both this, you could talk about kind of the coalition uh, versus alliances or where it fits it and this prioritization uh, of regions and how you see that. Sure. I mean, I think we have entered uh, an era of uh, what we could call flexible uh, multilateralism. Um, uh, it's, you know, what Donald Rumsfeld used to call the, the mission makes the, the coalition, right? I think we're very much in that kind of, uh, of trend, which is, uh, and you've, uh, you know, uh, mentioned a few of these informal coalitions that get together, countries that get together in, in ad hoc coalitions or contact groups or quads or trilateral formats or slightly bigger to deal with a specific issue. Um, sometimes it's based on geography. You have that in Europe uh, with uh, the Nordefco group, which is a group of Scandinavian Nordic countries 
that share the same geography and therefore share a proximity in terms of their core strategic interests. Um, so I think, and, and this is not, I would say, a concern. Um, it's not a concern for the more formal, bigger uh, institutions like the United Nations and others. It's complementary. Um, so, so I see that happening a lot within the EU, between the United States and Europe, between Europe and Asian partners, as you just mentioned, but also within the Asian uh, region. Uh, you've mentioned, you know, the so-called D. 10, these 10 democracies or the G7 plus India, South Korea and Australia that Britain, uh, you know, has invited to the next uh, G7 uh, uh, summit. Uh, why not? Why not? Uh, then, um, you know, the, the, the concept of having a, a summit of democracies uh, is slightly uh, has uh, encountered a slight pushback here in, in France specifically and, and in Europe. The problem is who do you invite and therefore who do you not invite? What kind of message are you sending? And therefore the summit for democracy uh, seemed to be uh, a slightly more, uh, um, I would say, um, yeah, uh, understandable, uh, understandable idea uh, that you could, where you could gather maybe a larger group of countries or maybe having a transatlantic conversation on our own domestic political uh, issues. Then on uh, the, the China um, uh, issue, the, the relationship, um, you know, there's been a lot of debate here in France, but also in Germany. How do we find a balance uh, between our relationship uh, with the United States um, and uh, our relationship with uh, China. And this, in fact, has spurred a lot of debate in, in Washington. Uh, you know, our French uh, President uh, uh, Macron has, uh, uh, you know, used the term puissance d'équilibre, sort of uh, uh, Europe as being a power, uh, not taking uh, a stand or being in balance between the United States and China, which has not always been well received either on the other side of the uh, Atlantic, but basically all of this leads to you know, what we call strategic autonomy. And this is very much linked to the discussion we're having today about alliances, because, uh, you know, getting into an alliance or working with allies uh, certainly leads to a certain amount of alignment on the policy priorities of the other members of the alliance, right? Uh, and the French motto has always been, we can be allies, friends, but not always aligned with the United States. Um, and that doesn't mean that we don't have a great, uh, a great cooperation. But I think in terms of the transatlantic partnership, and I'll end up here, is that there is no appetite today on both sides of the Atlantic to return to the old pattern where you know, the US decides, leads, and Europeans follow. And I think that the Biden team has fully understood that. That's part of the strategic autonomy debate. Merkel at the Munich Security Conference had that sentence uh, saying that our interests will not always converge, um, be it on China, uh, be it on uh, you know, the, the Nord Stream 2 uh, joint gas pipeline with, uh, with Russia, so there will continue to be points of tensions and disagreements, but the bottom line, especially in this competition between US and China, is that US allies, and I see exactly the same trend in Asia, doesn't, don't want to be forced uh, to choose a side in this competition since alienating either power could adversely affect its security or and or its economy. And I think that's very much uh, what the, the, the nature of the debate we're having here uh, in Europe within the broader framework of the US-China relationship. Um, Sarah. Uh, Thank you. Yes, uh, I just want to uh, make a couple of points. And in addition to the informal dialogues that have been mentioned between America's Atlantic and Pacific partners, I think it's also worth mentioning and recognizing there is a formal mechanism within NATO uh, the NATO partners across the globe, uh, which are individual partnership cooperation programs, Australia, Japan, South Korea, New Zealand already are members. 
And uh, the Secretary General has uh, expressed a uh, inclination for deepening and broadening these relationships, as did the 2030 report uh, from last year. Uh, Stoltenberg even recently mentioned India, uh, bringing India uh, into the NATO partners across the globe program. And it'll be interesting to see uh, what the reception in New Delhi is to that. Um, on uh, China and the prioritization, that doesn't come as a surprise to anyone in Europe. And I think Alexandra is right that uh, despite being aware that this was going to be priority out of the gate for the Biden administration, there is a reluctance and a wariness about having to choose. Um, and I think the onus is also on the Europeans right now who have spoken a lot about strategic autonomy and have tried to clarify what they mean by that, but to come to the table at the NATO Leaders Summit later this year with concrete proposals. What will it look like in action? And particularly uh, on that latter point, what about a NATO EU division of duties, right? How are we, what is this vision going to look like? So um, I was a little disappointed uh, at the, uh, 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 Chancellor Merkel's and uh, Pres French President Macron's recent comments at, Mu at the Munich Security Council special edition last month was hoping for more discussion on concrete proposals, but uh, hopefully that will come later this year at the summit, as I said. It would be interesting to see what New Delhi might say to kind of a, a being part of that um, dialogue. It was quite interesting last year, um, Ambassador K. Bailey Hutchinson actually in Brussels hosted uh, the, the Australian, J J Japanese and Indian ambassadors uh, for kind of a quad meeting in, in Brussels. And these are take these ambassadorial meetings have been taking place in various capitals, but it was particularly interesting to see um, that. I'm also struck by uh, Alexandra's comment about autonomy and alignment and alliances. And I feel like India, the other country that talks a lot about strategic autonomy other than France, has a somewhat adjusted view where they don't want alliances, but do want alignment and will align on particular issues or interests. Um, Victor and Zach, before we turn to the China question, I just wanna ask some, uh, speaking of kind of this coalition and partners, we're talking about a lot uh, of this kind of engagement. Victor, you've served in government. Is there a danger that there's gonna be this proliferation of kind of alliances, coalitions, partnerships, uh, does the bandwidth and capacity exist um, for this? I think it does. Um, I think that, um, I mean, it requires, I, I guess I would say it requires some rejiggering or reformat. That's rejiggering is not a good think tanky academic term, but it's a, a, a reformatting of, um, of, of how we do diplomacy. And, you know, it's clearly started at the top with the statements by, by the leaders. Um, um, that I, I refer to it as not alliance diplomacy or anti-China alliances, it's coalitional, right? It's coalitional diplomacy um, and it could be issue-based. Um, <clears throat> the um, It's undeniable that, you know, in the current environment, we're seeing uh, countries both in Europe and Asia facing these, uh, I'm actually writing a book on this now, facing these binary choices, binary choices, where there isn't the sort of headspace that they used to have before. Um, and so, um, and, and, and these are challenging and every country would prefer to be able to choose based on the issue. But I think for the United States, the question becomes, how can you, um, how can you make it such that, uh, how can you frame the conversation in a way such that allies see these choices that they're making as not necessarily being anti-China choices, but being choices that are you know, supporting the rule, rules-based order in Asia. We're talking about a resilient Asia. You know, at CSIS, we've been writing reports about how these choices are not about anti-China, but they're about building a resilient Asia in terms of supply chains and clean networks and and um, uh, a rules-based order. So, so in that sense, it's both in terms of the language that we use, but also in terms of how, how we do diplomacy. Um, um, and the Quad was a very good example of that. It, you know, that was all about a resilient Asia, whether it's uh, COVID or supply chains or other things. Um, it, it wasn't uh, spoken about as an anti, anti China alliance. And, and I think it's a smart strategy overall. I mean, understanding all the sensitivities across the board in the Pacific and in the Atlantic with regard to being coerced by the United States to do things. But I think for, uh, for everyone who doesn't want to be coerced by China, 
right? These, um, uh, this is the best asset that we have, whether it's alliances or alignments, because it's the target of what China and Russia are after, right? Their whole, they're, they're targeting, and they were targeting them over these last four years, our alliances and partnerships around the world. So this is, you know, most certainly an asset we can use in trying to accomplish that goal. One of my favorite things uh, whenever there's any quad activity is the response that comes from Chinese officials or analysts. And my favorite this time was uh, a Chinese professor from Fudan University who labeled it the, China, the coalition of grumblers. Um, uh, Zach, uh, on, not just on the coalition of grumblers, but what are kind of the biggest challenges, whether it's kind of uh, on uh, alignment of interests or kind of bandwidth, etc., cetera, um, for coalitions? We've also got a specific question from Ashton Gillard um, on a budgeting question. How do you respond to recent reports that the DOD's security cooperation funds should be transferred to the State Department for Management? Let me take the, the first question. Um, so I want to build on what Victor said, because I think part of the task for the Biden team is to shift the way the U.S. talks about alliances and partnerships, and in fact, to shift the way we talk about our great power strategy, which I've always thought was not a particularly effective term to use abroad. So if we are saying to our friends in Europe that the U.S. is in a great power competition with Russia, and we're saying to our friends in Asia that the U.S. is in a great power competition with China, it doesn't give them a lot of reason to want to you know, sign on board with a US approach, right? We have to explain that actually this isn't about US China or US Russia. This is about the basic rules and norms that undergird the existing system. And that's not about what America wants. It's about what those like-minded coalition of countries wants. And that's where our focus should be. And so I think when we frame this as great power competition, that actually it damages our cause broad. Um, what we should be focusing on is, is what our objective is, right? And, and I think therefore um, we have several different objectives and we're gonna have different coalitions in these different areas. So you know, I, I've suggested that there's probably going to be a security coalition, there's going to be an economic coalition, there's going to be a tech coalition and, and probably a governance coalition. We're not going to merge those. This is not the Cold War. We don't have a, a unified group of countries like we did in Europe that have similar political and economic systems. There's variation, um, especially in Asia, right? Where some of the partners that we're going to work with are non-democratic and we're going to have to be okay with that. Um, and so part of the challenge for us is to build these separate coalitions. And in many ways, this is much harder than the challenges that we faced during the Cold War, right? It's going to be much more complex and the coalitions are going to change and shift over time. I think we're just at the beginning of trying to figure out how to do this. I think the Quad is a bit of an experiment in this regard. Um, but, but some of what Victor was talking about is, is so critical here, which is, we've got to bring along countries where they're most willing to play a part. So asking our European allies to play a big military role in Asia, you know, Sarah's written a really important piece about this. I, I think there's going to be some skepticism, right? Um, one place where the Europeans absolutely are a critical voice and where we need them to do much, much more is on the economic side, right? And asking about what are the economic rules of the road? What are the rules of the road on governance, right? And so on these kinds of issues, I think we have to be comfortable with different kinds of coalitions and with our allies and partners taking leadership positions in different areas at different times. And that, that's just a really, really tough issue. Uh, Sarah, I was going to ask you this in our China round, but since we're here, you, you wrote a piece uh, in the Washington Post uh, calling for NATO uh, to kind of, you know, that it, you, because you've written about it lacking uh, purpose and, and, and relevancy or being in danger of that, that, you know, the China challenge or kind of the Indo-Pacific is where NATO should look. Uh, Zach has, has expressed one view. Um, tell us what you, your argument for why that's what NATO should be doing. Yeah, I just want to clarify, since Zach mentioned the piece as well, that the, my recent piece in the Washington Post quite clearly did 
uh, singled out and said, I'm not talking about a NATO military presence in the Indo-Pacific or Asia. Um, I think the problem is that as soon as you mention NATO and China in the same sentence, people stop listening uh, and their eyes glaze over and they Im immediately conjure up visions of NATO flag vessels in the South China Seas. But the reality is uh, there's a lot that we can talk about, including the NATO and China, that's happening in the North Atlantic region. As the piece noted, whether that's the Arctic, whether that's in terms of resiliency, right? So I just wanna reiterate again, and the Secretary General Ian Stoltenberg has gone on record, right? That having a discussion about China's growing influence in the North Atlantic is not uh, uh, equivalent to talking about a NATO military presence in the Indo-Pacific or Asia. Though I should note that NATO has operated in the Indo-Pacific before in, in terms of a, uh, a counter piracy mission, but I wanna be clear that that's not what I'm calling for here. And there's a lot that we can discuss about NATO's uh, role in uh, addressing the rise of China in the North Atlantic. Also on uh, the Europeans' reluctance to choose sides, uh, I would say, well, they've already chosen by virtue of the fact that they are in an alliance of democracies, right? So uh, I think the, the smaller European countries are there and recognize the challenges and threats that China poses to the North Atlantic. Uh, I'm worried about Germany, uh, with the exception of the defense minister there, who is not probably likely for uh, the, long for that job given the upcoming German election. Um, I, I worry about US-German relations in, in, in the coming months, uh, particularly also in light of Secretary Blinken's uh, strongly worded statement on Nord Stream 2 yesterday. Uh, and I want to come come back to that. I would also say, you know, on this kind of there's a there's a tone um, tone matters as well. And uh, you know, I, one of the things I've noticed to kind of Zach your point um, about you know whether it's whatever you want to call a great power competition and how you want to frame it, but it's um, you know uh, uh, Jake Sullivan was asked about uh, last week about Indian new uh, new rules in India that would potentially exclude Huawei. Um, and, you know, he didn't do the full court press about, yes, that's what India should choose, but just said that was a sovereign Indian decision. Uh, and it is something um, that the U.S. does have concerns about Huawei and, you know, thinks is, is following the discussion closely. Um, I have to say the Trump administration did come around to that view towards the end. But in the in, initially kind of the you must choose a certain thing on Huawei didn't go down well uh, in a number of countries, in fact, ends up being counterproductive because then countries feel they don't want to do something under U.S. pressure. Uh, Victor, I do want to kind of come to um, what I suspect we'll be talking about um, for ages. And I, I want to kind of frame this as the China-Russia section for a bit. Um, we were competitors, maybe not great power competition, but competitors, potentially adversaries. Um, yesterday, the, the, the meeting in uh, Anchorage, um, some will say that, look, the, the fracas that we saw, it's things that people think or have said privately, or, uh, and it's just that we, we got to, all of us got to see it live. Um, and so, you know, it's the kind of revolution playing out on TV. In this case, it's competition playing out on, on TV. What's your assessment, at least your preliminary assessment, since uh, we, we've, the, the meeting's still ongoing, of, um, of kind of the, the, this, the meeting itself? Um, well, you're right. I mean, Tommy, you, you know, we still don't know. Uh, and, you know, they're not going to do a joint press conference <laughs> or, a joint, or a joint communique for certain. I don't think that was ever the intention. And, um, you know, it's and uh, I, I think the administration has been pretty clear that it's not a strategic dialogue. I mean, you know, we had these uh, what were they called? We had the senior dialogue, the senior policy dialogue the senior the economic and security dialogue, I, this is not a continuation of that. This is really more of a taking stock meeting, if you will. Um, and, uh, and it's probably gonna be a long list of things that the administration will talk to China about um, with regard to their activities over the past, over the past few years. But I, I, want, I think it's the way um, that Zach put it, I think is important, this notion of you know, we in our bilaterals with China, we may talk about it as a great power competition. I mean, we may do that with them, but the broader message around uh, Asia and Europe should not be that. Because once you do that, what, what do you trigger in all these allied countries? You trigger entrapment fears, right? That's the first thing that, and, and particularly in Southeast Asia, you trigger these 
these entrapment fears. And so, and, and, and we don't want to do that. Right. I mean, and so uh, I really like the formulation of focusing on the objective rather than, rather than on the, the, the nature of the competition with, with China. But I really don't know what else we can say about this Anchorage meeting till we, till we hear more about it. But um, I'm certain that, um, um, uh, that uh, both sides went in uh, without their gloves on. Let's put it that way. Sarah, you wanted to come in on this? Yeah, just quickly. Thank you, Tanmi. I don't think anyone was expecting sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows, right? Secretary Blinken was quite clear going in that this was not a strategic dialogue. Also, given the topic we're discussing today, I think that it's important to note that in addition to playing to each side's domestic audience, I think this was really about third parties, whether it's U.S. allies, partners, or the unaligned, right? The Biden team quite clearly wants to show that it's back on the international scene. And China wants to communicate that the world has moved on. Uh, And uh, I think it was a good thing, as has already been mentioned, that Selvin briefed the E3 and Stoltenberg in advance, because I'm sure that in addition to uh, the anxious calls in Asia this morning, there were some in Europe as well. Uh, It's clear that both sides had a lot of pent up frustrations from the past four years. They wanted to get off their chests. But there has to be room for dialogue and diplomacy as well with China, especially on areas uh, like climate change. We have the upcoming uh, Biden leader summit on climate change next month. Um, And I want to go to Zach and then Alexandra on this night, have a Russia question for Alexandra as well. Um, Zach, um, your thoughts about um, the, the, you know, rumble in the jungle, um, whatever the web version of it that we're going to come out uh, with. Uh, but also um, a question that we have from Alex Lennon from the Washington Quarterly um, that uh, about the two alliances that we have not discussed, uh, Thailand and Philippines. Um, you know, how would you how would you see uh, those alliances? How will they differ in the years ahead compared to the alliances with Japan, Korea, and Australia? Um, and your general sense of how you think this this the kind of just, even if we don't have the results of this meeting, but just what we saw yesterday to Sarah's point will be seen in the region. Yeah, I I think um, the interesting thing about the Anchorage meeting is there are two different views emerging. One is, oh, this was a bit of a blow up and, and, you know, something has gone wrong. The other is, this is kind of natural, right? The US-China relationship is going to be full of friction. And in the past, I think sometimes American leaders have been a little unwilling to tolerate some of that friction. Obviously we don't want it, but at the end of the day, I agree with the administration. It has to be a results oriented relationship and the results can't just come from one side. And so if the Chinese are going to come to the table and act the way they appear to have acted yesterday, I think the administration's exactly right to stand firm. Um, and And that's fine. We've passed some messages along uh, it's clear where both sides stand. Um, and, and I think that's not a bad outcome, actually. Uh, so um, I'm sure the discussions were, were quite tense in, in private as well as in public. But I, I think the bottom line is um, they're tense because we have some real disagreements, right? And, and papering over that is not the right approach. So um, that's my view on, on Anchorage. I, I think on this question that Alex asked, which is an important one, um, you know, the Philippines and Thailand, not only have we not talked about them yet, uh, interestingly, they're, they're not in the interim national security strategic guidance. They're, they're the only alliances not mentioned. Um, so I'm sure they are feeling a bit nervous at the moment. Um, and they should be because this is an administration that has committed to talking a lot about values, right? And uh, we have two allies in Asia that are not living those values. And so that's going to make it much more difficult to work. Um, And I think, frankly, uh, we see some really different approaches in Asia to the last few years of of, uh, American alliance policy, right? So I have a piece coming out early next week with Lindsay Ford, your old colleague uh, at Brookings, um, where we look at Asian responses to the Trump administration. And I I would say they fall into four categories, and the Philippines and Thailand are are the latter of these. Um, One response is you just double down on the US alliance. That's basically what Japan has done. I I would call that anchoring. Um, The opposite of that, of course, is accommodating, right? You you, uh, sort of realign to, to the other side. That's what we're seeing today with Thailand to some degree, right? They are being particularly accommodating 
uh, to, to the Chinese. There are strategic reasons for them to do that, but it is going to be a problem in our alliance. Um, and then you have two other options, which I think we're seeing a lot around the region. One is uh, to augment the US alliance with other relationships, right? So um, I think where we've seen this the most clearly is from the Australians. So Scott Morrison said in a, a private meeting earlier in the week that he thought the quad leaders meeting was the most important thing to happen to Australian security policy since ANZUS. Um, they think this augmenting effort is really critical. Um, and then finally, there's, there's a category which I would call autonomizing, which I think is what we're seeing from Korea and, and some others right now, where they seek more independent capabilities because they're less convinced that the US has shared interests with them. So, you know, I think there are basically four different approaches, anchoring, accommodating, autonomizing, and augmenting. We're seeing a bit of all of them from, from many countries around the region, but I think from the Philippines and, and from Thailand, um, certainly we've seen a bit more accommodating from them than, than the U.S. would like. And I, I think it's going to take some time for that to change. My expectations of where the U.S.-Philippine relationship goes are very low until 2022, uh, until we get a leisure change in the Philippines. It's just going to be very difficult to work with the administration there, um, given the approaches that our government is taking and that their president has taken. Yeah, it, it also kind of, I think we'll also see, and this is a, to a question uh, Vivek Kilker uh, from Cosmopolitan Globalist asked about, um, you know, he asked about Asia, but I think it could be true of other parts of the world as well, which is how countries will exercise their own agency. Uh, and we saw this during the Cold War, we will see it again, uh, playing one off against the other, but then also trying not to get squeezed in the middle. And so finding kind of that Goldilocks, you know, just right position, and it's always hard, but um, it will also um, stress this kind of values, uh, kind of values and interests uh, uh, trade off a, a little bit. Alexandra, uh, you had comments about kind of the, the China um, front, but I also want to ask you about Russia, because it is the other kind of uh, country in which there has been some kind of sense of difference we saw some tough language from the administration on Russia, the Biden administration, but we also saw uh, some tough language on the Nord Stream 2 um, but, uh, uh, and warnings to Europe uh, and, and actually say this is, this is dividing, uh, this is intended to divide Europe. So how do you see the differences over Russia, particularly since uh, you know, Pre President Macron has been, it's not just been the Germans, has talked about needing to find kind of a modus vivendi with the, the, the Russian something, something by the way, even the Indians and Japanese say uh, at, at times. So um, could you talk us through kind of the China-Russia differences and how they might play out? Sure, I think there's a lot of uh, parallels we can do between um, our relationship with China and, and Russia. In, in both of these relationships, Europeans are clearly seeking to have a more balanced relationship with more dialogue and uh, less uh, confrontation. But the challenge with both Russia and China is that we are in uh, what I would call compartmentalized relationships. And, and Blinken has said that very clearly a few days ago, the US-China relationship is based on cooperation, on competition and confrontation. You have pretty much the same approach uh, at the EU level where we see China as a partner, but also as a systemic rival. We also see Russia as a threat because also of the proximity uh, with, uh, with Russia, but also as an indispensable partner on many key issues, including Iran, climate uh, and uh, nuclear disarmament, but also uh, Afghanistan. I mean, it's amazing to see how US and Russia are continuing to cooperate uh, on Afghanistan despite uh, the tensions uh, that, that we see right under our, our eyes. So this compartmentalized relationship are the most difficult to manage because you're constantly shifting from a partner relationship to a competitor relationship or even an enemy confrontational relationship. Um, and to me, the eye opener uh, for Europe when it comes to the relationship with Russia has really been the COVID-19 um, uh, crisis uh, because this had made us, had made us realize in a quite 
dramatic and brutal way uh, that uh, our short-term economic industrial uh, relationship with China could have deeper durable political strategic implications. And so we're having pretty much the same debate as the Americans on how do we also make our supply chains more resilient uh, in the industrial pharmaceutical area. This leads again to the so-called strategic autonomy debate. And what's interesting to see is how the German debate has also kind of grown closer to the French debate. On Russia more precisely, um, I would say, you know, um, Europe's Russia policy is always a result of a compromise. So it's never perfect. Uh, from the Washington perspective, it's always considered as being too soft. But it's always a compromise between those countries that want uh, to take a tougher line, uh, the Baltics, Poland, the Nordics, and those who want to take a softer line. And there you find you know, the, the camp with France, Italy, and with the Germans playing at a usual role of intermediaries. So you always end up with kind of um, intermediary uh, uh, policies. And that creates also a source of um, tension and, and sometimes um, I would say disappointment on the Washington side. Very quickly, two seconds on the Nord Stream 2, just to summarize it, I would say this is the perfect example of German strategic autonomy vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Uh, but this is a real point of tension. As you mentioned, Blinken has made some very blunt statements and you know, has uh, shaken the sanctions flag uh, again. This is going to happen. Um, and this to me is, is going to make the reset um, of the US-German relationship in the post-Trump era. Uh, slightly more more complicated. And it does bring up this question, uh, as somebody who looks at the US-India relationship, this kind of potential sanctions hanging over kind of a partner's head issue comes up as well, and does bring up that broader question about, you know, uh, while it's seen differently here, many see it as the US weaponizing interdependence uh, as well. Um, I will say kind of one of the challenges for all the countries, because I agree with Victor if I had to identify one watchword from the Quad Summit, it was the word resilience, building it across. But the challenge will be, uh, and it speaks to this autonomy point, is how do you get to that resilience? Is it kind of diversifying, you know, building up your own, or is it kind of turning to some form of, you know, protectionism or going it your own way or kind of not working with others? And so there's, I think you're, you're seeing elements of both in almost every country we've mentioned today. It'll be interesting to see where it plays out. Um, I want to take, I do want to do a round robin at the end as we, as we end up and ask you, and you can pick one of them, or if you can uh, highlight all three, that's great. Um, starting with you, Victor, for each of you to give me your kind of one big challenge that you see uh, for the administration in revitalizing alliances and partnerships, uh, one recommendation you'd have uh, for the administration, uh, and one recommendation you'd have uh, for uh, allies and partners. Victor, start with you. So, um, so I'll just stick with a a Asia, if that's okay, because <laughs> uh, um, we have a lot of expertise around the table here. Um, so, I'd say the one one of the big challenges is um, in in Asia is the relationship between our two key allies in Asia, that's Japan and Korea, <clears throat> which has spiraled down to about the lowest point it's been in. You know, I mean, you can go back maybe to to the early 1970s, um, it hasn't been it hasn't been this bad um, um, <clears throat> because you know that's important not just for dealing with um, uh, China. It's important for dealing with the North Korea problem, and it's important for this this overall effort at coalitional diplomacy. What the what the Biden administration should do? It's not that it's not easy to say. I mean, you, you don't want to mediate between these two, but I do think. Um, uh, playing a role behind the scenes as the United States has done historically to try to get the allies to focus on the bigger strategic problems and, and challenges, um, uh, acknowledging that some of the uh, historical difficulties in these court cases are going to be there, uh, but focusing the two allies on the broader um, defense and strategic questions, I think is, the, is, the, um, is both the challenge and the policy uh, going forward. Sarah. 
Thank you. Yes, on the one big challenge, uh, picking up on Alexandra's comments from a moment ago, uh, it's internal cohesion, which is nothing new for NATO, right? Uh, the alliance is divided over uh, Russia and China, and so political will is going to be um, uh, hugely important in the coming months. In terms of recommendations for the Biden administration, I have two, so I'll be quick. And they're somewhat at odds with each other, but the Biden team is extremely accomplished, and so I'm confident they'll be able to pull it off. Um, for me, revitalizing alliances, revitalizing the NATO alliance in particular, has to mean more than America is back. So I'd like to see more of a discussion of a prioritization among threats and challenges. Um, and uh, I think that will be important going forward. Uh, the second recommendation is uh, something that so far uh, the Biden administration seems to publicly at least to be aware of. It'll be interesting to see whether that message is also communicated privately behind closed doors, humility. Um, recognize that the world did not and Europe did not stand still these past four years, right? Uh, just like uh, 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 National Security Advisor uh, Jake Sullivan has spoken a lot about making US foreign policy work for the middle class, that's a concern for European members of the alliance as well. Well, and there are a number of elections. We had the Dutch election uh, earlier this week. Uh, Germany has already begun the regional elections. France will be holding national elections early next year. Um, so recognize uh, the domestic politics concerns and issues in our allies and partners as well. And uh, lastly, in terms of recommendation for the allies, just to reiterate what I said previously, come to the table with concrete proposals of your own uh, regarding what strategic autonomy will look like, because I actually think that message, uh, once we see concrete proposals, will be welcomed by this administration. And I guess in Europe, there's the there's similar issue, though not that bad to what Victor mentioned, which is the tensions between the US and UK, um, oh, sorry, the EU and the UK, um, which seem to be uh, developing or evolving as we, as we speak. Uh, Zach, Thanks, Tanvi. It's been a great discussion. Uh, I'll just add a couple of thoughts. First, you know, I, I think the biggest challenge for the Biden team is convincing Asians in particular that the U.S. is going to be there, not, not just through the next four years, but after that, right? We're in this very strange situation where if you look at polling data, Donald Trump attacked allies constantly. He attacked free trade constantly. You know what got a lot more popular the last four years? alliances and free trade. And yet, friends in Asia, they've listened to the rhetoric. And there's, for good reason, there's some skepticism that the US is going to, you know, put its money where its mouth is. And, and we've heard some skepticism about trade in particular from the administration, right? Um, and so I think the really hard challenge is for them to say, the US is back. And we're not just back for the next four years, but we're going to stay back and we're going to stay engaged. I think the logic for that is pretty clear, um, but we have to sell it to the American people. And, you know, sometimes those of us in Washington forget that. Um, and, and, you know, actually Donald Trump was our best salesman. He convinced people that actually allies were important, but we've got to keep that momentum going. So that I think is the biggest challenge. And then I think the, the issue for our allies and what they need to do is, is similar to what we were just talking about in, in NATO, the U.S. can't just return and have the allies say, oh, thank goodness, um, now we can stop doing some of this hard stuff that we were going to have to do if the U.S. wasn't here. We need the allies to step up. We need them to do more. And some of them have, um, but, but others, frankly, have not. And um, so we need allies to help us stay engaged and um, to help themselves push the issues that are most important. If we end up in this situation where, you know, the U.S.-China relationship is the critical thing and um, the altercation in Anchorage, as I'm trying to, to phrase it, uh, is, is sort of what everybody's watching with bated breath, that's going to be the mistake. The center of gravity in Asia is in Asia. It's what allies and partners do to respond to China, and that's what we have to watch the most closely. I mean, these issues of American credibility and allied burden sharing, you can almost think of the tagline, help me help you. Um, no, thank you to Jerry McGuire. Um, Alexander, you get the, the last word on this. Um, two, two words. Um, one is really building on what we just said, which is that um, obviously we need to rebuild trust uh, in the transatlantic relationship and therefore US 
commitments need to be the I mean the main message we need to have is that US commitments within alliances on the international scene are sustainable and will not be reversed in less than four years from now uh, by the next American president. Um, and so there is a lot of uh, US diplomacy to be made with the world, but a lot of diplomacy to be made at home and especially within the US Congress. So that I think is really the number one uh, expectation from the part of Europeans is to see US international commitments, US recommitment and reinvestment in multilateral organizations as something that will last beyond uh, President Biden. Second, uh, on my side, what can Europeans do? I think this leads to what Sarah said, Europeans must act with greater coherence if uh, they want the United States to remain engaged in and with Europe. That is still terribly lacking when you see our policies vis-a-vis -vis Russia, China, and many others. And I think that we should seize the opportunity of both the so-called EU strategic compass and the NATO strategic concept as an opportunity to see how we can better coordinate both the EU, NATO, and work better together and waste less money and less time. Uh, thank you, Alexandra, and thank you to all our panelists, uh, to Victor, to Sarah, to Zach, to Alexandra. This was so rich a discussion that we went over um, over our time five minutes. Thank you all to those who you've been watching, for those of you who stayed over time. I also want to say a, a special thank you to Agnieszka Bloch, who has helped Jim and me put this all together. We couldn't; It wouldn't have been possible without her. So thank you again, and hope you have, have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you, Tommy. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.